Hi everyone and welcome to our final review. So we've spent a good 12 weeks together going over the foundational topics of gesture drawing. I know it's a lot of information to keep in mind while you're drawing, but with dedicated practice, it'll eventually become a part of your intuition. Now I want to spend a little bit of time reviewing all the topics that we've covered. The first topic, if you recall, was line of action. Now the line of action should represent the main idea of your pose. It's the foundation upon which you will build the rest of your drawing. Strive to distill your drawings down to their bare essence. The second topic was shape. Shape will help you determine the overall feel and the dynamics of your drawing. Shape will also help you determine the overall composition of your drawing. You can think of it as the framework within which your drawing exists. Strive for shapes that are conducive to the ideas you're trying to communicate. The third topic was silhouette. Silhouette is all about clarity and readability. Strive for strong silhouettes so that your drawings can be read even when they're completely blacked out. The fourth topic was space. Using space will help give your drawings depth and make them feel grounded in a physical reality. Strive to use space to increase the dynamism of your drawings and to pull your viewer into your drawing. The fifth topic was exaggeration. Using exaggeration in drawings is analogous to using hyperbole in rhetorical debate. You're pushing extreme examples in order to effectively communicate your ideas. Strive for communicative accuracy over anatomical accuracy. The sixth topic was extrapolation. Extrapolation in the context of gesture drawing is the process of seeing beyond the surface of what is in front of us. Strive to capture the invisible ideas you see in a pose, rather than just the visible physicality. The seventh topic was story. A story is about contextualizing your drawings. Without context, information has no meaning, and the same is true of drawing. So strive to give your drawings a narrative context. Now, as I'm sure you've gathered from the lectures, the main takeaway from this class should be the two questions, what is the main idea, and how do I best communicate that idea? Now, these two questions will be guiding beacons for you when you're lost in a creative fog. If you take nothing else away from this course but a habit of asking and answering these two questions, then my job will have been done well. I want to end our time together by telling you guys a little bit about my own journey with drawing and why gesture drawing has been so important to my growth as an artist. So this is me, hello, and this is me as a kid. Now one of my earliest memories is from when I was about four or five years old. I was sitting in my living room waiting for my dad to come home from work. Now I knew when he was home because I could hear the rumble of the garage door opening and closing and I could hear the jingle of his keys as he was walking through the door. And before he could even put down his briefcase, I ran up to him with a pencil and paper and I asked him to draw me a picture of a horse. Now my dad isn't an artist, but he would indulge me and his drawing looked something like this. Now it was the only thing he knew how to draw. It's not very good, but I remember being amazed. Drawing was like magic to me. And seeing something come from nothing with a few strokes of a pen just blew my mind. Now, I was hooked, and I spent the majority of my childhood trying to understand and recreate this magic. Now, this is a terrible drawing from when I was about seven years old. Um, I'm drawing, it's a drawing of Mickey and Minnie Mouse, and apparently a dog named Spot up in the, up in the right-hand corner. Uh, this is Chip from Beauty and the Beast. I think I was about eight when I drew these. Now, obviously, I was copying drawings from Disney books and magazines, but just being able to mimic something so that it was recognizable was so thrilling to me. And as a result, a big portion of my artistic education came from mimicry. I spent a lot of my childhood copying anything and everything that I was interested in. And one of the things that I was really interested in as a kid was comics. Now, comics 
were an endless source of entertainment for me, and comic book characters were one of the things I copied over and over again. Now, unfortunately for me, the X-Men comics I grew up with weren't these classics. They were duds like this from the 90s. Now, this is a Rob Liefeld drawing of the X-Force. Uh, he was very big in the 90s, even though he wasn't a very good artist. You know, but as a kid, I didn't know any better. You know, you think that if it's published, it must be good. So I started mimicking that kind of work, and I drew stuff like this. Right, another terrible drawing. I think I was about 12 years old when I did this. Um, but I thought the more muscles, the more veins, the more bullets, the better the drawing. Unfortunately, because of my poor influences, I confused tedium with sophistication. And unfortunately, there were still great artists working in comics. I remember seeing this cover by Alex Ross at the comic book store when I was a kid and being really enamored by it. Now, his work was such a fresh departure from the hyper-fantasized stuff that I had been looking at. So, naturally, I started copying his work. But unfortunately, I misunderstood what made his art great. You know, when I'd see paintings like this, I would think to myself, Whoa, that's so realistic. I equated realism with quality. So, you know, I thought the more realistic it was, the more artistic value it had. So... You know, I wanted to be a good artist, so I wanted to figure out how to make things look realistic. So I began to study the science of drawing. Right? I studied anatomy, I studied proportions, I studied lighting and perspective. And after a couple of years of studying these things, I started drawing pictures like this. And this. And this. Now at first it was really satisfying being able to capture a likeness. But after spending a few years honing these skills, I reached a point where I asked myself, you know, where is this going? And when I did the mental exercise of extrapolating realism to its logical extreme, the answer to that question would be paintings like this. Right? These hyper-real still-life paintings from Flemish artists in the 1600s. Now, while the craft was really admirable, I would always think to myself, you know, what's the point? I remember being so bored at the museum when I would see paintings like this. They couldn't even hold my attention for more than 30 seconds. And every time I asked myself this question, I couldn't come up with an answer. All right? I had reached a sort of artistic existential crisis. I'd fallen too heavily on the side of mimicry and realized that it was a meaningless, empty void. And as a result of that, I stopped drawing. I spent a few years doing other things, you know, being a teenager, studying hard and playing sports and hanging out with my friends. And I did this for a couple of years, and it wasn't until I saw this movie, Tarzan, the Walt Disney's Tarzan, that things began to change for me. I saw these Glen Keane drawings, and I began to see drawing in a completely different light. His drawings were so expressive and so emotive. You know, they were so lifelike without being realistic. And I realized that I had been missing the point. I had focused so heavily on the technical side of drawing, the, the science of it, that I had forgotten about the soul of drawing. And the emotion, the feelings, the ideas. When I look back at those early drawings that I was copying as a kid... You know, I realized what originally drew me to them wasn't the realism or the tedium. It was the life and the emotion that I was drawn to, right? the soul of the drawing. And with this new understanding, I had a whole new set of challenges and obstacles in front of me, and I was reinvigorated with a love for drawing. Drawing had a point again. The challenge now was to figure out the science of the soul. Now, I want to share with you guys a short passage from Martin Luther King Jr.'s book, Strength to Love. Now, it's the first paragraph in his essay titled, Tough-Minded and Tender-Hearted. And it goes like this. A French philosopher once said, No man is so strong unless he bears within his character antitheses strongly marked. The strong man is the man who can hold in a living blend strongly marked opposites. 
very seldom do men achieve this balance of opposites. The idealists are not usually realistic, and the realists are not usually idealistic. The militant are not usually passive, and the passive are not usually militant. The humble are very seldom self-assertive, and the self-assertive are rarely humble. But life, at its best, is a creative synthesis. It is the bringing together of opposites into fruitful harmony. As the philosopher Hegel said, truth is found neither in the thesis nor the antithesis, but in an emergent synthesis which reconciles the two. Now, this is one of my favorite passages, and I realized that what he was saying about the strength of man is also true of drawing. A strong drawing is one that bears within its character the two antitheses of draftsmanship and vitality. Now, the years I had spent observing and mimicking honed my draftsmanship skills, but my drawings were too heavily skewed toward that side. I needed to rebalance it with the tension of vitality. And that's where gesture drawing came in for me. Now, why gesture drawing and not figure drawing? Well, the problem with figure drawing is that the focus is always on observation. There's too much time, uh, you know, when you're given 20, 30, or 60 minutes to do a drawing, it's difficult not to fall back on observational drawing. It inevitably leads to fetishizing a particular aspect of the body. But with gesture drawing, when you only have 30 seconds to capture a pose, you can't rely on observation, at least not entirely. You're forced to interpret, to feel, to improvise. And that's where vitality comes from. Now I want to show you guys where my drawings are now. You know, now that I've spent a couple years doing gesture drawing, um, you know, hopefully it will demonstrate to you uh, the value that gesture drawing has added to my work. So the following pages are, are from some of the same gesture drawing exercises I had you guys do over the last 12 weeks. Now this first page is from 30 second poses driven primarily by the line of action exercise. Now this next page, uh, these are also 30 second poses um, and these are from the extrapolation exercise where we took a model and I tried to imbue the ideas and the emotions I saw in that pose into uh, an animal, in this case an elephant. And this last set of drawings is uh, from one minute poses and these are from story exercises. So I would take you know, a model, I would take the pose that I saw in the model and I would try and contextualize it, um, give it some sort of story, make him a character in a situation. So. Hopefully these drawings are demonstrative of the value gesture drawing has added to my work. I think without it, my drawings would be solid, but lifeless, realistic, but not believable, aesthetically appealing, but meaningless. And ultimately, meaning is what makes something worthwhile, right? That's what we're all striving for, whether in art, in work, or in life. And that's why gesture drawing has been so important to my growth as an artist, and why I think it's important for everyone interested in strengthening their drawings. It helped me refocus my thinking onto the more substantive stuff. It's why I put this class together, and why I continue to teach it at work. So, this is the end of the lecture, and the end of the gesture drawing course. I want to thank you guys for taking it. And I hope you guys found it as educational and enjoyable taking the course as I did teaching it. I want to wish every single one of you the best of luck on all your future artistic endeavors. And I really look forward to seeing your work out in the world one day.